Welcome to a virtual version of the Lord's Day service for June 19th, 2022. I'll start by reading some scripture. Our first reading today is from Kings. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. This is 1 Kings 19. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life like the one of those by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid, that is Elijah, and he got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servants there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree, and he asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take my life away, for I am no better than my ancestors. And then he laid down under the broom tree and he fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and he laid down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat. Otherwise, the journey will be too much for you. He got up and he ate and he drank. And then he went in the strength of the food for 40 days and 40 nights to, Hebra, to Herob, the Mount of God. At that place, he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant and thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, and the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting the mountains and breaking the rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And then after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle, and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And then came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, and the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel as king over Aram. Our next reading is from Galatians. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Now, before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law it was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to the disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you were, as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offsprings, heir according to his promise. And our gospel reading today is from Luke. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Then they arrived at the country of the Gerizims, 
which is opposite Galilee. And as he stepped out, stepped out into the land, a man of the city who had come with demons had met him. For a long time, he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house, but in among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice. He says, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him, and he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged them in order to not, to not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there was a hillside and a large herd of swine that was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission, and then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it to the city and to the country. Then the people came out to see what happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man whom, uh, from whom the demons had gone, sitting in front, in front of Jesus at his feet, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how uh, the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people in the surrounding country asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned, and the man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus said to him, saying, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming through the city how much Jesus had done for him. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, Elijah was on top of the world. He had done incredible things. God was with him. Having seen what he saw and did what he did, to doubt the power of God would have been foolish. His enemies were vanquished, and he trusted God completely in this time. But then all of a sudden, his confidence was completely gone. Queen Jezebel said to, this, said to Elijah the very thing that he feared the most, that he was a fraud, that he was just like one of those prophets of Baal that he had defeated and killed. So, G, so um, Elijah ran away, and he begged God to take his life. But God didn't rebuke him. No, God didn't even try to coach him or buck him up. No, he just sent an angel. And the angel made a few hot cakes on the stones and brought him a jug of water. And he did this again and again and again. Elijah was trying to make sense of it all. I mean, there was a tornado, but God wasn't in the tornado. He was in, there was an earthquake, but God wasn't in that one either. There were fires, but God wasn't there. Then the sound of sheer silence. Nothing. Only then did God come. And he came in a whisper. This is the way God works most of the time. Now, I pray for the power of God myself. I wish I could slaughter all of the prophets of Baal around us, just like Elijah. I want fire. I want lightning. I wish I could cast out demons like Jesus. Don't you? I want to cl cleanse our town of Sin, I want to make things right. Maybe God will empower me to do these things. Maybe he will empower you. But then I am filled with doubt, and I want to run away. The townspeople are grateful for what we've done, but they really would rather that we don't do too much, you know, because it is bad for business. 
But that's not how usually how God works. God usually doesn't work in these dramatic ways. Instead, it's more about accepting hotcakes in the desert and a jug of water and listening to whispers. Three weeks from today, I will be ordained in your presence, and I will take on the yoke of Christ. They will put a, uh, a stole over me, which is the yoke of Christ. And I've thought a lot about what that, mean, what that will mean. And I think it primarily means that I won't be backing out. I may, be, may feel like running into the wilderness, but as long as you don't come after me with pitchforks, I probably won't, or at least I won't be gone for long. Officially, we, you and I, have decided to make a go of it together. You decided in recent years to invest yourselves into this, this church, make, it, make a go of it. And I have decided to come along for the ride. Now, you know, it's a pretty lousy time to get into the ministry. I heard a lot about this when I was in seminary. In fact, the ministry nowadays seems pretty darn apocalyptic. But it kind of goes along with the mood of the world right now, honestly. The church is collapsing all around us. People are afraid of war. People are afraid of authoritarianism. It seems to be taking over. Democracy is under severe threat. We have massive and growing economic inequality that's fueling these feelings. Our rights are threatened and it, we fear that they're being taken away. And there seem to be a lot of Christians in our midst who have forgotten what the American ideals of pluralism and inclusion are all about. But you know, one of the benefits of knowing history is knowing that none of this is new, really. I read an article in the Financial Times recently that reminded me of this. It's by an author named uh, Simon Cooper, and it's titled, Democracy Might Be in Crisis, But Autocracy Certainly Is. The Putin fan club, the admiration of the rise of China and its efficiencies, the bizarre admiration that some people have for Hungary and its dictator, Viktor Orban. Notwithstanding all of these things, the attack on voting rights and the distortions of misinformation are real and very threatening. We need to be vigilant. We need to be good citizens, don't we? But the article states how much it's underreported that authoritarianism, these autocratic regimes around the world are in free fall right now. And democratic societies like our own are actually thriving. No one wants to live in China, despite its wealth and its growth. Hong Kong and Shanghai are losing their smartest people. They don't wanna be there. In fact, the surest way to make a Chinese nationalist really angry, and I know a few Chinese people that I'm good friends with actually, the surest way to make them angry is to point out that nobody wants to live there, that the smart and the rich people in China want to get out. The Ukraine war also shows us how rotten and weak and corrupt Russia is and how these people that are in cahoots with them are really on the wrong side of history. Turkey, which also is an autocratic regime, has hyperinflation now. And the inward looking anti-immigrant Hungary is stumbling badly. So who's thriving? You may not believe it, but we are. And Europe is. The democratic countries in Asia, like Korea, Australia, New Zealand, they are doing well. Sure, we have lots of problems. We have much to be vigilant about. We need to protect our country and our democracy. But wherever pluralism thrives, people thrive.
tucked into this uh, little um, letter of Paul's to the Galatians is one of the most astonishing statements in the ancient world. And let me read that again to you. Therefore, the law is our disciplinarian. Uh, I, I want to be careful about this word disciplinarian because uh, the Greek word is actually pedagogos, gogos, I'm sorry, pedagogos. And that comes pedagogy, you know, teaching. So it's really more less of a disciplinarian and more of a guider or a teacher. Therefore, our guider or teacher until Christ came, so the law is that, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you were baptized in Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew nor Greek. There is no longer slave nor free. There is no longer male nor female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. That is amazing. When, especially when you consider that this was in first century Rome that these words were written down. This means that we can rule ourselves as Christ is our example. We are no longer subject to the law, nor any king. And our strength is in pluralism because there is no longer Jew, nor Greek, nor slave, nor free, nor male, nor female, but in Jesus. Now, when I say Jesus, I don't mean Christianity. I don't mean the church or the government, but Jesus, the Christ. This is why we can have confidence in Christ. And we know that these present difficulties and this present uh, time, we will overcome that and we will live through it. We have been through a lot. It's been traumatizing. It's been hell for a lot of people, including us in this congregation. We are a grieving congregation. We have lost many beloved members. Carol and I suddenly lost a beloved friend in our Oregon church recently, and it was gutting and difficult. And then I had to say goodbye. We had to say goodbye to my mom in recent weeks, and that was really hard. But I believe that God has brought us together so that we can hold each other, and that we can embrace each other in our mutual time of need. The sense of mourning is not just with us, but it's national. It's with all humanity right now, it's international. We are all finding new ways to live together. Amanda Gorman, who was the presidential inaugural poet, you might remember her, she captured this moment really well. She talks, she had a recent uh, book of poems with, uh, talking about the pandemic and all of the challenges and how we have had grit in the face of the pandemic. Now, Amanda is 24 years old. She's African-American. She grew up to a, in poverty to a single mom in Los Angeles. She has a speech impediment that she had to overcome. She speaks with a voice of all who suffer tragedy and grief. So let me read you this poem. It's called Surviving by Amanda Gorman. These words need not be read for our blood to run through them. When tragedy threatens to end us, we are flooded by what is felt. Our faces fluctuating, warped like an acre passing, seasons, perhaps years, are plotted and planned. Just like seeds in a fresh plowed field, when we dream, we act only with instinct. We might not be fully sure of all that we are, and yet, we have endured all that we were. Even now we're shuddering, the revelation aching. It didn't have to be this way. In fact, 
It didn't have to be. But gone were, and they are, no threshold, no stepstone beneath our feet. Even as we did not die, they did not die for us. We shall move for them. We shall only learn when we let this loss, like us, sing on and on. This, my friend, is my friends, is why I am with you. Not for world winds, not for earthquakes or fires. I am here for the sound of sheer silence, to listen to the whispers of the spirit. Our future is bright, whether we like it or not, despite our loss. Whatever it is, when we sing on and on, as long as we welcome all, as long as we are open to all, for grief is the great equalizer. There is no Jew, nor Greek, nor slave, nor free, nor male, nor female. When we come together in Christ, in Jesus alone. Let us pray. Holy God, let us know Jesus. Let us hear the whispers of the Spirit. Let us follow the leadings of God. It is easy to be discouraged, but in our grief, we will find you. In the quiet moments, in the sound of sheer silence, that's when we are open to hear your voice. Speak to us, O God. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.